So welcome to WEMcast with me, Owen Walker. In this episode, we're going to be talking with Carl Betts on reflecting on practice. Carl is a paramedic and a quality improvement fellow based in Sheffield, working for the ambulance service. He's been a paramedic for nine years and has a 10 year extensive history of expeditions featuring multiple trips to Everest Base Camp, K2, Mongolia, South Africa, Swaziland, Tukal, Aconcagua, Pakistan, Oman, and many more. He's recently uh, written two pieces on reflection, uh, one of which has been published in the College of Paramedics Hindsight magazine. And this is uh, a piece around normal or numb, and the second piece around the second victim and me. So in this episode, what we'd like to do is just really explore and examine these articles, Carl's motivations for writing them, and just pull out some of the uh, salient learning points for uh, both of these pieces in the interview. So welcome to the uh, WEMcast, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So, Carl, before training as a paramedic, you had 10 years of exploration around the world, from completing your mountain leaders course to Everest Base Camp to K2 Base Camp and many mountain and desert expeditions. Could you sort of speak to that uh, experience and what it gave you? Yeah, I think... When you when you're out on trips, you don't realise how much of a how much of a, a solid grounding it gives you for for many many other aspects in your life. Um, because um, th- there can be very very busy expositions and there can be sort of chaotic at times as well. Uh, in in many in many situations, especially when you're you know in a new country that you've never been before, you're in a new city that you've never been before um, and you're still trying to organize all the admin and all the logistics um, but one of the biggest things that it gave me was um, personal and cultural development and growth um, just being open and exposed to so many different cultures so many different people of all different age grade, age ranges and also so many different abilities in in in, in one group and trying to to manage that situation with such a broad level of um, abilities just really made made you think, how are we going to do this? And the teaching style for one person may not be suitable for another, so can you do it all in group activities or do you have to do more one-to-one coaching? And it's having the ability to look at a situation, read into a situation and try and think in the future of this expedition, what am I going to have to do in order to get as many people as we can through it with the with the controls that I have basically? Um, and it took me some amazing places, places that you know you've just got to be thankful for a just to see, but b to get paid for, and c to actually be a part of someone's. You know, someone's life journey, you know, taking t- taking one chap's brother's ashes with him to K2 base camp, you know, to a lot of people, it's about getting tops of mountains and it's getting to, you know, the specific, specific high points of things. But actually, for this gentleman, it was like really profound because he's taken his brother's ashes to a place where his brother wanted to be. And, and I was a big part of that of, of that journey for him. So, you know, profound things like that, you, you don't realise how much of an influence you have on people's, on, on people's outcomes, basically. Um, and I, so you've got to sometimes remember that actually your job is to make sure that they get to where they want to be in, you know, in whatever circumstances you can manage it, basically, as long as it's safe. Um, and and it, that stood me in really sort of good ground and things like that. Um, and the other thing that I found really, I've noticed now to be really important that I didn't realise how important it was, but when it's come to sort of pre-hospital medicine, is the ability to sort of be thinking, right, three steps ahead. So if I do X, what is now going to happen in the next five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, three days, four or five days, and try and run them scenarios through my head to basically make sure that I'm not caught 
I'm not caught like a rabbit in the headlights for the situation that's happened with the ability to sort of act on instinct as things develop. But being able to sort of plan ahead, I just think makes life a lot easier for you in the long run. Uh, and that's something that the expedition work, especially in countries like Pakistan, where, you know, you're on the Karakoram Highway for two days, you've had three or four buses because there's landslips and you've just got to keep swapping bus and swapping bus. Um, and there's none of that written down. It's just a case of, well, well we've got to get, we've got, that bus is turning round, so we're going to have to get on it. And it's going the right way because there's only one road, everybody on. Um, and it's that ability to sort of just get on with things that actually has been the best best learning ground for me. Listen, that's fantastic. And uh, like you said, it really lends itself to being a paramedic, I guess, uh, or a pre-hospital practitioner, because you have to be flexible. You have to adapt to dynamic change. And and like you say, you have to be prepared for the plan A and plan B to fail, um, which it does consistently on the expedition. And everything you just said there it are, are fantastic sort of almost uh, cognitive models of, of what to expect in the future as, as a paramedic. So absolutely. So Carl, could you, um, could you speak to some of the... Um, revelations that you learned through um through these trips just around maybe navigating through through multiple trains was there any sort of safety tips or situation awareness tips that you before we get into your your inception as a paramedic through these 10 years of multiple trips in multiple continents from a situation awareness perspective was there anything that you fundamentally learned or or took with you um, for me, it, it was all about the 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 planning ahead and the um, and the background knowledge side of things. So if if I'd never done a trip before, you know, you'd be leaning on colleagues who you knew had done the trips in the past, and try and glean as much information as you can from them. Ask for their ask ask for copies of their their trip notes. Because I always write, I was looking at them last night preparing for this actually, it was really quite interesting going through some old trip notes because um, I've still got all my books. Um, and just the more knowledge you've got about the situation, the more knowledge you've got about your clients, which comes down to your background work when you first get in country, before you get to the point where, like if you're doing a peak trip, before you get to the point where you get onto a peak, you're already making assessments by the way you manage the group, the activities you do, as to, right, okay, so in this group of 10 people, who have I got to work with? If we're pairing people up to do things, who am I likely to pair teams up with? Who are the weak ones? Who are the strong ones? Who's got the, you know, some people have never put crampons on before and then they're heading out to the Himalaya to go and do a trekking peak such as Mera Peak. You know, yes, it, it technically, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's not a technical peak. But for someone who's going to altitude for the first time, has never put crampons on. Really, we don't want to be putting crampons on the day before we're going. So, I ask them questions and get the knowledge to say who's done what. You know, hands up, be honest. Let's go through this together. But I've never put crampons on. Right, every day start putting your crampons on because when we say at four o'clock we need to be up and out. You don't want to be faffing about with your crampons trying to put them on. It just wants to be second nature, bish, bash, bosh, on with it. Um, because if one slows the group down because of something like that, you've got a group who are ready, getting colder, stood around doing nothing. And it's all about this planning. And, and that's what I took took from it. That's fantastic. And so just looking at now moving forward to 2012 when you we, when you started to learn uh, the trade of being a paramedic when you went back to training school what brought you to paramedicine in the first place Carl? So I started getting a little bit not tired of being on the road but when you're spending sort of seven eight months on the road it's if you start if you start thinking you know what I just want to breathe. I don't want to go on another trip. 
but you have to because you need to earn money and that's the that's the, the the line of work that you found yourself in you're potentially doing yourself a disservice and you're definitely doing your colleague your, your clients who are paying a a, a a lot of money um to be on these trips if your heart isn't a hundred and ten percent in it and i started noticing this um and i'm very much a at the time, I really had no commitments, and I was very much a realist of the fact that I didn't have a mortgage, didn't have any worries to worry about at all, really. Um, so it was a case of, right, you know what, I'm just going to do something different, start start sort of looking for other options, and if I want to come back to it, I can, but I'll come back to it refreshed. Um, I didn't come back to it in the end because I ended up going into going to university. Um but I also met my Ruth, met my partner Ruth, um, and that wanted that that was a sort of actually by me going on trips all the time that is potentially going to um, cause a problem with a relationship. Um, and you know, I'd found somebody who I actually, you know, I want to make this work, um, and, and and that was a big uh, a big point for me. Um, but my other previous history, I always. I always seem to go to the thought processes of um, medical medical issues. So when I was a, a crewman on the lifeboats uh, back in my hometown, I always used to enjoy Casivax because I used to always be thinking when the doctor was on board or sometimes if there wasn't a doctor on board, we all limited first aid skills. Right, how are we going to manage this and what are we going to do? And in paramedicine, you know, right, this is what we've got, this is what we have to do, how are we going to do it? And that was a good grounding. Um, and that, when I thought about what do I want to do, that was in the back of my mind. And and I also did some safety cover for some TV work uh, in the Middle East in, in Oman. And with the inherent risk of the actual job that was happening, um, there was a real risk that if it went wrong, this would be, you know, it would be a bit of a mess. Um, and I was heavily involved in this. And I was at the point where if it was going to go wrong, that was where I was. And again, in my head, in the sort of planning ABC, you know, how many plans can we have? If this goes wrong here, what are we going to do? Um, and it all just came back to that. And when I did decide, I'd say, I need a job that's going to be varied, that's going to be interesting, that's not going to be sat behind a desk all the time. Um, I'm out and about. I can make my own decisions. And generally, you're going to be with a group of like-minded people, which we are in our world. Um, I thought, you know what? Let's have a go at that. And it was a bit of a big decision because going to uni when you're 30, when you've never been to uni before, you know, that's your job done because it's full-time uni, it's full-time, well, it's your shifts as well. Um, so Ruth was a massive support because, yeah, you know, she, she she was looking after the household bills and the household income because I wasn't earning anything. And by the nature of the beast, being an outdoor instructor, it's never that well paid. So, I, I you know, I didn't have a massive financial backing uh, to help me out. Um, so, so, yeah, so it was a big... Big commitment, really. That's fantastic, Carl. So what it does, it really illustrates that at any age you can really come to, you know, you're not too old, really, to ever too old, really, to, to, to pivot and change. And so at 30, you know, you came back to university, studied paramedicine to, to become a paramedic in, in Yorkshire, I believe. And um, and so just, so just fast-forwarding a little bit, Carl, you know, you're on that journey, You've got a very, very much a supportive partner, and you're just you're you're just about to become qualified. You now then become qualified. Let's let's fast forward to looking at this normal or non piece. Actually, if that's okay, in the in the in the College of Paramedic Hindsight magazine, because it has a t- attracted a lot of attention for for good reason. Actually, um, could you just deconstruct it, unpack? What it is, we're going to put it in the show notes as well, so people can read it. But uh, uh, but as a fantastic reflective piece, could you just maybe unpack it, and it, it, what prompted you to write it, and, and what it's about? Yeah, so so normal on none was something that I I wrote about following an instant that I'd been involved in, and I find writing kind of quite cathartic for me. 
Um, and it can take me months to write a piece because it's just a non-pressured thing. I think about things, I talk to people, and over time, these things just gradually evolve. So this was about six months in the making, this piece. But it was from a specific instant, which when people first start reading it, they may think, oh, grief, you know, what, what you're writing, things like that for. And it was basically about a, a gentleman who had passed away with some form of... Um, drug overdose um, in quite an unkept, um, dirty house. It was freezing cold. Um, and we tipped up to this incident. Um, I got there as a lone responder. A colleague of mine, one of the supervisors, tipped up as well as, as again, a lone responder. And actually, very quickly, we determined that this chap had passed away. There was nothing, nothing we could do. So it was sort of fairly formal, call the roll, get the police involved, uh, wait on scene for the police to come to hand over the to, to hand over the deceased. But then while we were there, we then just started talking about what we're having for tea, which then got on to talking about, well, we'll have a Chinese who's ordered to pick up, which for us at that point is just completely a normal thing to do. But then when I left the house and sort of for the for the rest of the shift, I was sort of thinking most people in life don't see things like that. We see things a lot in them situations. And that situation just becomes so normal that once we'd acknowledged the fact that this chap had passed away, then it was all time, right, OK, next next job is what we're having for tea because I'm hungry. And I then started questioning myself as to, actually, is that healthy? Is that really, you know normal behaviour, as in if I get somebody off the street and put us in the same situation, it would be very, very different. But for me and for my colleague and for lots and lots of other people who I've spoken to and who's read this, states that, yeah, that actually is very normal for us, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily right in some respects. Um, and that was what got me thinking um, and the title, which a friend of mine helped me with, you know, normal, no, it just really sort of encapsulates, is this just the normal me and is this a good normal me or am I just so numb to things that actually I just don't see it anymore and am I missing things by not seeing them? Um, so that is the, 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 the pretext of the, of the, of the writer, really. So I can really sort of engage with that, really, and identify with that as well. Um, uh, from from your perspective, Carl, how do you know whether you're on that spectrum of normal or non? Because I think a lot of people maybe of, of years and years experience might just be going through these circumstances and and almost not be self be aware enough to to know that they're numb. It, was there was there a wake up call for you? Was it was it just that revelation on that doorstep as you were coming through that you thought, hang on, this is not this is not normal? Or is there any or, or is there um, is there any sort of engaging your an emotional intelligence? Is it, is it worth clinicians sort of sitting down and thinking about these things? Uh, I think that's that's the million dollar question and that's and that's here lies the issue with um personal mental health um in the fact that in, in the actual full text of uh, normal on them because the, in the insight magazine for the paramedic um for paramedic uh call for the college of paramedics that's actually a, a slightly abridged version because um because of this because of the the, the space in the document in the full version, I actually talk about, I see my my mental health management as a big, just a big box. But the problem with this big box is I don't know how big it is. I don't know everything that's in it. I don't know how full it is. I don't know when it's going to tip over. So basically, you just have to manage the situations as and when they arise. And for me... It could be one massive incident, even if your box is only half full. It could be one massive incident that just rapidly fills it up and boosh, 
that's it, you're in crisis. Or actually, you could have just been filling that box up, tricking away for the past 10 years, and then all of a sudden, the most benign incident to everybody else, but just what presses a button for you is just enough to fill that bucket up and overflow it. And the issue with that is, if you've got stuff right at the bottom of that bucket that you've never dealt with, when you come to start dealing with it, you've got to drill right the way down to the bottom of it. And the bigger you fill that pile, the harder it is to actually start managing it. And I think that's why it's so important to try and be aware of your own mental health management to allow that box not to get full, to be able to put something in it. But actually, if I'm putting something in it, let's try and take something out of it and let's try and balance everything up a bit um, on the knowledge that you are going to keep in our line of work, you are going to keep adding to it. I think there's, that's just a complete inevitability. Um, but it's how you manage the the clearing some of that some of that um, baggage that is the important point. And I am a big advocate, and I've said it a few times before that. And some people sort of think I'm a bit cynical when it comes to this, but I firmly believe in it. In our line of work, in the job I do, I am only ever one job from never doing the job again. Some of us have it. Some of us don't. I don't want that job. But when I book on, a du on, on duty at six o'clock in the morning, the only thing I know that is going to happen that day is that I've booked on shift and... At some point in that day, I will be going home. It's not on my shift shift end, probably. It's probably much later than that with the, with the way the ambulance service works. But that is the only thing that I know. And, 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 and I think that causes a lot of stress for a lot of people. But I think the important thing is, is just to try and try and manage your own self and having your own self-awareness. And that's not something that I've gone on courses for. That's not something I've done masses and masses of reading about. I am just aware from me being um, looking around and chatting to colleagues that I've seen amazing, amazing clinicians and lovely people tipped over the edge and lose a career and have to look for other alternatives. And I think that is not only sad for, for them, it's sad for the families, it's sad for our line of work, because you've potentially just lost 20 years of 20 years of knowledge that the newly qualified paramedics and the new emergency care assistants, you know, they need to draw that knowledge off them and then we lose these, these members of staff. And one of the reasons I manage my mental health the way I do is the fact that when I was a 19-year-old lad, I found myself in a situation in the, in the hills um, where my planning hadn't quite gone, gone right and I ended up getting a bit uncomfortable. Um, and the person who was managing that situation turned around to me and... Um, it was a Welsh, a Welsh uh, sergeant in the uh, Welsh Guards. Turns around to me and says, while he was laughing, you know what? There's positives in everything. It's sometimes hard to find, but they're there. You've just got to look for them. And that was a was a a really pivotal moment for me because I was absolutely minging at that point. I was absolutely soaking wet, freezing cold. Everything was sodden, and. I was going to be uncomfortable for days. I realised that it was quite sort of oh, grief. However, when he said that, I was like, right, OK, there's got to be something in that. And actually, it takes a lot of finding sometimes, but there is positives to be found. And for me, the positive of writing this piece, one, it helped me process things. But two, the positive is that we're talking about it. The positive is people have read it and have now discussed it with colleagues. And for me, there we go. So out of that potential not very nice situation of the incident I was involved with, people are now gaining some form of positivity from it. And I think for me, that is a good way to manage things for me. 
I think you're right. And I think that insight, Carl, having having that insight and just knowledge that you are going to be adding to that to that bucket every day. And then therefore there is a mandate that you need to find a release valve. You need to find something uh, that 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 does set you free or, or that empties the bucket. You know, coming back and we we've spoken about this on other podcasts about this sense of play. And as adults, we don't enter into the sense of play much anymore. But but finding something where you can just completely disconnect connect um and 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 yeah. find find the release valve and uh, often around play albeit mountain biking cycling playing sports um hiking in the in, in the hills but something that you can really identify with that you feel that you feel passionate about so Carl, just looking at your second piece, because that's that's a fantastic insight, Carl, and there's a lot to go at just even thinking about that one, actually. But just looking at your second piece now, because your second piece really hit me quite hard as well. And we'll put this in the show notes as well. And it's around the second victim in me. Um, so it's a, it was your second reflection. Could you just unpack this piece, um, sort of why you wrote it, what maybe the sort of second and third order effects of being a vi- of being a victim um, can can entail that you articulate so well in the piece? Yeah. So first of all, I, I'll just explain about what the second victim is because um, I'm not sure whether everybody will be aware of it. So I first heard the second victim in a talk in a presentation uh, a few years ago, and once I heard it. I sort of didn't think anything of it. I thought that doesn't, you know, that's got no relevance to me at all, actually. Um, but it was in there. And then all of a sudden, I, I ended up with a with an email on, a, I think it was a sort of a, just before the weekend, quite late on, basically starting to ask questions about an incident that I'd been on. And by the tonality of the, of the emails, I'd already guessed this wasn't going to be this wasn't going to be a fun, a fun time. Um, now, without all the knowledge, you then start thinking of worst case scenario. Um, I think we're pre-programmed a lot of us to sort of go straight down the line. What's happened? Because I haven't got all this knowledge. Have I killed somebody? You know, absolute disaster if I have. You know, because you don't come to work to do it. Um, am I going to lose my job? What's going to happen to the mortgage? What's going to happen to my reputation? All of a sudden, within 10 minutes, boom, all them them ideas are in your head. Um, And for me, the second victim and the the second victim methodology is that if you are involved in any form of investigative process or where there's been untoward um, outcomes for patients, by you merely being present and being involved in it because of the way it affects us you then become a victim yourself so you are a secondary victim to the incident that's happened now when i first heard about it i did listen and and took a lot of the information on but i didn't think it was relevant so i just parked it however when it started to become relevant to me until you feel these things i don't think you can actually say that you understand them and sometimes the actual documentation and all the knowledge around it, once you just know that actually I am feeling this now, I then knew that I needed to manage it. And the incident was around um, a, a, a query fractured neck of query neck, neck of femur um, that, that, that uh, was missed on assessment. Um, and the investigative process it had some positives because I found them, but it also had some 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 points that I just thought were just really badly managed from a very personal perspective. Um, and what I didn't want to happen was for for that knowledge to be lost from the experience that I had, because what we need to do is improve the whole management of investigative situations and um, how they're run. And sadly, people only talk about the bad bits of them, when actually, if they're done properly, they should be an amazing learning experience. And we should come out of it feeling better, knowing that when I go to that job again, I'm A, not going to potentially make the error if there was an error made again, 
but B, I've just improved my knowledge and therefore I've improved my confidence. With my improved confidence, I'm going to feel better. Done badly, you come out of that, that investigation feeling totally down, totally confidence battered, not wanting to do your job again. When you come to that exact same instant again, you're a mess because all you can think about is, well, what's going to happen after this one? Um, and that, if you get in that negative negative mindset, you know, can just be an absolute disaster. And I think the the way the investigations are run, a key to whether you come out of it with a positive slant or with a negative slant. I came out of it with a positive slant, uh, not only because of the outcome, I got a little bit of training, which I specifically requested, um, but B, because... I wrote this reflection. It was very cathartic for me. I really enjoyed doing it. And again, I put it out there and loads of people have spoke about it and said, you know what? Yeah, it makes real sense that. And actually, it's nothing new. It's, there's nothing, you know, groundbreaking in it. It's common sense stuff to me. Um, and by putting it out there, people enjoyed it. And I enjoyed writing it. So everyone's a winner, really. But the but the essence of the whole piece is about if you're involved in something untoward, by the nature of the investigative process, you are going to have uh, potentially a negative time of it yourself. Carl, could you just speak to um, just how you have embodied sort of the how you embody, embody the sense of equilibrium back in your life now because I'm, I'm if I'm right in thinking you you kind of you you live on a farm you live or or indeed with six chickens seven sheep a dog called Juno uh, two cockerels um and you, and you've also you also um practice some carpentry as well H how have you managed to equilibrate some of your mental health and, and offset it from, 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 from it being purely work focused? So I've got a young family. Um, so young families inevitably keep you very busy, which is a massive positive. I've got a three month old baby daughter called Etta. I've got my, my toddler son called Ben, who is a million mile an hour, who's got loads of space to be a million mile an hour. So we end up being a million mile an hour as well. Um, I've also got all the animals, like you've said, um, and my and my woodwork and my and my general messing about in me, in the workshop. Um, for me, the city is a busy place, and I work in a city on a response car on my own. Kind of quite busy. Sometimes gets quite intense. But when I leave work, where I live, and I'm very fortunate, and I thank my blessings, you know, to have the ability to live where we live. I mean, I'm looking out my window now and all I can see is trees, grass and fresh air. Um, and I have that ability to be able to say the city is a world, where I live is a world. And when I drive home, I look in my rear view mirror, driving over the hills on the Ridge Road, I can see the city and I'm driving away from it. And when I come home, I've got a busy family to look after um, and be a part of. There's millions of jobs need doing around the yard. Um, and then if I go in my workshop, I've got a wood lathe where I do wood turning. And if I'm particularly stressed or particularly just wound up about something, I really enjoy wood turning. Um, because of the intensive concentration, it's the same as, um, same as some climbers have. You've got to be in that moment and you've got to put all your brain power into that moment because one movement of my gouge on that piece of wood, if I lose concentration, that beautiful piece of wood and that beautiful ball that you're wanting to turn is ruined because you've just lapsed in concentration and taken a massive chunk out of it. So for me, it's quite an intensive, immersive experience that you've got to be in the moment and you can't think about anything else. Um, so I find that really sort of healthy for me. So Carl, sort of jumping about a bit, but just, just coming back to something you said earlier 
um, which I thought is fantastic about just having compassion on people that are going through this 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 time. Because I think just just as, as we were coming to land slightly, I'll speak quite candidly around around how it affects your decision making and it, how it affects your time off as well. You know, being part of an investigation, it bleeds into your into your practice, into your time off, into your family time. So you know one of the mandates you you give is is around being compassionate in dealing with someone who's who's going through um through through a time like that could you sort of just speak to that uh finally uh, because just just really from embodying it yourself so yeah what a lot of the things what i learned when when the the, the investigation that i was involved in was was underway I learned quite a lot of A, how to do things, but also B, how not to do things. Um, and if I was in that situation of being the, um, the, the the lead investigator, if you want to use that term, um, there are certain things where because I've now experienced it, I would not do. And there's, again, to me, simple things that the communication that you have, for instance, if it's by email, be open and honest and put in, the, uh, put in as much information as you can to alleviate many of the questions. So if somebody asks you a question about the investigation, the person who has been investigated, in which case, it, in this case, it was me, I don't want a three-word email because that is just going to ask more questions. I want a detailed response to the and a timely response to the email that I have raised or the question that I have raised. Um, because otherwise, you take that snippet of information and your brain runs with it. And if your brain runs away with it in the wrong direction, well, then you, you're just getting down further on this spiral. Um, and for me, some of the emails that I received within the course of the within the course of the investigation, were neither use nor on them um, and actually just made things worse. Um, little things like put yourself in, in the other person's shoes. You know, if I am sat in this room, knowing that I am going to be questions about actions that I have taken, how would I feel? So, for instance, the, 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 the room that I was sat in had two tables, um, across from each other so me and the person who was asking me the questions were probably six foot apart in between me and that person was a pile of nice guidelines laid out the Joint Royal College of Ambulance Services uh, guidelines laid out right in between us so instantly there's just a massive barrier straight in front of us there you know for me have a chat, have a cup of tea and biscuits, you know, make the whole situation as comfortable as possible. It's never going to be 100% comfortable because people are asking digging questions about things that have gone on. However, you can make it slightly more comfortable. Um, and for me, if you're going to do that sort of job, do it for the right reasons. You know, if you're doing it because you like to see people squirm, or you're not interested in the learning that can be taken place from it, you shouldn't be doing it. And actually, you need to be made doing reflective practice yourself um, into how you do it. To me, you know, it should be all about what has happened, how can we learn from it, and how can we all benefit from it? Because anybody who says people can't benefit from even just being involved in these things, I'd say you, you need to sort of reevaluate reevaluate where you are um because you can learn in every in every opportunity oh that's fantastic i i wholeheartedly agree absolutely so listen just as we come into land on the conversation carl uh, as i'm mindful of time you talked about this incremental stress that and there'll be hopefully a lot of paramedics listening to this and, and a lot of nurses and doctors that practice pre-hospital care um and face incremental stress. So they're, they're consciously or subconsciously filling that bucket up. Um, 
what would you uh, with sort of ever increasing workloads as well with the with the pandemic? What would you say to them if they're listening to this at this at this time? Uh, there's a few things that I've that, that that I've taken on board from other people and from my own sort of personal personal journey. But the big one is never be afraid to talk. Um, nothing I've written about is new. Nothing I've written about is groundbreaking. None of it's, you know, high flying this or high flying that. It's just a bloke who's talking about an experience that I now know most people in the room that I'm sat in at work have experienced. But I'm the only one who said, oh, well, then, shall we have a chat about it? In a totally informal, just having a cup of tea and having a natter. And the fact that I now know that the bloke sat next to me has had exactly the same experience as me makes me feel better because I know it's not just me. And that's a very, very simple thing that actually crew room chat is important. And the problem we have within our world, in, in terms of ambulance world, is we're so busy, we don't have that time on station anymore. We don't have that time just to have a rant, have a rave, have a moan, and then sit down and have a laugh about it afterwards. And we we lose that process time. And for me, who works on the car, I might do a 10-hour shift, not see an ambulance because we, do, we, we don't need one because we've referred the patients on, come back from my break, there's no one on station. So I spend 10 hours effectively just on my own. Now, if you happen to be in a negative cycle, you know, it's potentially not helpful. Now, I choose to do that job because there's massive parts of it that I love, but I am aware of potentially how bad it can be. Um, but by talking about it means that I'm managing it. Um, now, the important thing is don't only talk. Be aware that people may want to talk to you. Now, it may well have taken them months to build up the courage to actually engage in this informal chat about how they're feeling. You know, once you open open the doors about your personal self, you know, that's a big commitment and putting a lot of trust in somebody. If you don't take that opportunity and if you don't catch the, the, the body language, the signs that actually this person wants to talk to me, if you blow that opportunity on them, they may never open up again. And they could, and you could, unwillingly or unwittingly, be a major part in a negative spiral for them. Um, and I think that's massively, a massively important point. Um, be nice. Be nice to yourself and be nice to everybody else. You know, if you're nice to yourself, you're going to feel better about yourself. If you feel better about yourself, People are quite happy to have a chat to you because you know you're going to you're a nice soundboard and you're going to have a laugh. Um, and I just think that's really kind of quite important, you know, because if you're not nice to yourself, well then you know you're the hardest critic. You know, I am I am my worst critic in the world, um, and I know my colleagues are the same to each other. But actually, when you chat about it, everyone's in the same boat, really. Um, and the other big one for me is the final one is flip flip your negatives to a positive. You know, there's got to be a positive in there, which that sergeant told me about when I was 19, when I was in a shell scrape, what was full of water because it had flooded. Um, you know, I found positives in that. It took me a week, granted. Honestly, it did. But I found them eventually. And you've just got to put the time in and be willing to open yourself up to it because if you're not willing to open yourself up no one's ever going to help you because nobody's potentially going to know Carl, that's fantastic that's absolutely fantastic and just really insightful as well and and really honest so listen carl if people if that's resonated with people uh, which I'm sure it has done. How could they reach out to you, mate? Is there any platforms that you run that that you could uh, that people could engage with you on? The the best place is my, my work email address, and it's all lowercase letters. Uh, Carl.betts at nhs.net. 
Um, and I think I'm I think I'm the only one, so there's no numbers after it. Um, so yeah, feel free to send me an email. More, more than more than happy to chat about things. Um, you know, because chatting's good, and I'm just chuffed to bits that a random piece of writing that I did after a a random incident one night in a city centre uh, has opened opened these doors to 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 chat about stuff that is not new. It's 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 it, it's all stuff that we know that we just need to do. Carl, listen, that's fantastic. We'll put both pieces in the show notes, both both of the reflective pieces. We'll put your contact details in the show notes as well. And it just leads me to say thank you so much, mate. You know, reading those uh, as myself, uh, being in the ambulance service uh, for for a, a, a long, long period of time myself, I could really relate to a lot of what you were, what you were saying. So they're fantastically insightful pieces. Please do go check them out. They'll be in the show notes of this, uh, of this interview. And uh, just please and say, thank you so much, mate. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.